You're in the right place at the right time, stretching from the distant space ports of Black Spire and Mos Eisley, all the way to the jewel of the core at Coruscant and the bright center of the galaxy, slamming into your hollow projector like a supercharged nanoparticle of coaxium. This is the Star Wars Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, John, and my co-host is... Jason. And we are here to bring you your needed dose of Star Wars film, TV, book, comic, gaming, and collecting news. The date is March 15th, 2021. And uh, it's a little slow for Star Wars news lately. Um, but uh, we have heard that there is a new Nintendo exclusive coming to the Switch. Which uh, Nintendo hasn't gotten a Star Wars exclusive in many, many years. I know fans have talked about that and kind of been wondering, but uh, Star Wars Hunters, like a battle royale game, I guess, because I guess that's what the kids are playing these days, aren't they? That that is the hot. Well, it was. I don't know if it's still <laughs> it's still is it not striking when they iron super hot, but yeah, yeah. No, actually, I this sounds intriguing. Uh, there was a teaser trailer. With some kind of imagery of like Jabba's palace, and you hear some fighting sounds and everything. Um, I'm open to the idea. I'm thinking about getting a switch, and I well, think this would be a purchase. You you mentioned that it's a switch exclusive, and as far as like consoles, it is. But I guess it will be on the Apple App Store and Google Play as well. So oh, maybe they're gonna come out with like a. A tablet version or a uh, or yeah, a I think I think that's version. how it's getting onto the switch. Actually, is that it's okay? It might be more geared toward because you know there's like mobile versions of battle royale games, right? Right. So this you is know, coming coming at it from the other angle of like not going from PC down into mobile. It's right. going from mobile and then kind of going into the consoles, but just the switch. Right. Well, well, it's maybe still, it's, it's still not... a win for Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, it is a win for Nintendo. Maybe it's not the Nintendo exclusive fans have quite been hoping for. I, you know, because back in the day, there was Rogue Leader on GameCube, and mm -hmm. there was, um, trying to think of well, Shadows of the Empire was an exclusive for about a year before the PC version came out. Um, and then I think uh, Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike was a GameCube exclusive, I'm pretty sure. And it used to be a common thing back in the late 90s and early 2000s that Nintendo had a, uh, a working relationship with LucasArts to have that. And I guess the way the... the um, everything has shifted now where it's like Xbox or Sony... Mm -hmm. I guess Nintendo's kind of lost in the shuffle in a way, you know. Yeah. Well, they 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 gear more toward a different uh, gaming demographic. Yeah. yeah, they do. They do. It's always been kind of more oriented towards families and kids, and you know, well, <laughs> you can get Doom on Switch, but yeah. still, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I I see what you mean, and. Yeah, it should be an interesting game. I'm I'm curious about it at the very least. Um but yeah, it's coming out, I guess, uh, later this year. And um I'll get it. I have a switch and it's free, so there you go. <laughs> That's enough for me. Yeah, heck yeah. Um now we're gonna talk about Tales from the Most Isley Cantina. Um this has been a long simmering retrospective review that i've i've been waiting for and you've uh, been waiting yeah that i've been waiting for um we're gonna do a part one we're gonna cover roughly half the uh short stories in it and this has been one reason i'm excited about this is this is a book that's one of my most loved star wars paperbacks i've read it I think five times over the years, over the last 25 years. Um, it's one I go back to at least like every five to 10 years. And it's well-worn and I got it 
I think like the week or the first couple weeks it came out in uh, the summer of 95. And uh, what what was, was there anything that stuck out in your memory? Do you remember like around the time it came out? I don't. Um, I think I read it shortly after I read the the trilogy novelization yeah the that that three that you know collected the all in one paper, but the omnibus yeah um but i don't have strong memories of actually reading it i liked all the stories i remember the stories um, yeah and you know a lot of stuff comes back as i'm reading it now because <clears throat> um i only read it once mm-hmm. you know I haven't, mm-hmm. I haven't read it on a on a schedule like you have but yeah um I just, uh, it was kind of like the CCG, um, the, the Decipher CCG cards, mm-hmm. um, in that it, it fleshed out a lot of the stuff that you, you know, were curious about in most yes. likely yes. in Cantina. You know, that was why I really liked this anthology and, and the CCG cards, because it really does expand all, the whole scene. And um, I've said this before, but like, Tatooine is probably my favorite planet in Star Wars, and Mos Eisley is probably my favorite environment or location. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know why that is in particular. Uh, maybe I'm the opposite of Anakin Skywalker. I like sand, and he doesn't. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, um, I don't know. I, the uh, the idea and the imagery of Mos Eisley was always very cool to me. I like that. There's these kind of domed, you know, like buildings and like it's really seedy and there's crime around every corner and you got Jawas and different aliens and to well, me and it's, it was, and it's what Obi Wan implied with his line about Mos Eisley when they're looking down on it from the ridge mm-hmm. before they go in. Right that that scene in the movie when he calls it a shithole. I totally, he totally <laughs> was accurate. That's, that's in the, yeah, that's in the special edition. Yeah, that was You'll the special find edition. A bigger shithole. Bigger shithole than most likely. Um, yeah, I don't know if he's talking about that or Bakersfield. It's almost the same, but you know, yeah, it just there was something about the environment I found really cool, and you know, you get all the cantina creatures. The cantina stands as my favorite scene in the original trilogy i mean there's i have a lot of favorite scenes or at least a few big ones like the asteroid field in the empire strikes back and stuff like that i'm generally more of an action guy on my favorite scenes but i don't know there's something about the cantina it just i like the the aliens the music the the arm chopping um you got han and chewy it's just a really cool scene you got mm-hmm. hammerhead there's a lot of stuff um, going on a lot of stuff going on and that made it perfect for an anthology where you get to read these stories about the different aliens and characters and see their point of view on the events that go on so you know in we don't do weddings the band's tale we find out how figure and dan and the modal nodes got hired by chalman the wookie who owns the the cantina everything leading up to that and actually their short story doesn't cover a lot yeah actually in the cantina it like ends there and then that's kind of it yeah it really just explains how they got into it it explains how they got into it and basically they were java's band and he was their he was their favorite band and then lady valerian the rival crime boss on tatooine offers them money to come to play at her wedding they sneak away uh it's a big thing where throughout the wedding they're worried about java's uh cronies finding out which can't be that hard i mean how how many uh bith you know bald-headed bith wearing all black are there and precisely who play the clue horn and and band fill and the Omni box and all those instruments. How many, how many jizz whalers they got on the planet? Anyhow? Right. How many jizz whalers are there on Tatooine? Um, 
but I really like their show, their story, and it was by Kathy Tires who wrote the truce at Bakura, and it actually is interesting that she wrote this because uh, Kathy Tires has a background in music, according to her bio, and she plays the flute, and I think she's released some recordings with her husband over the years. So she she has a background in music, and that makes her ideal for this story and um, her description of of their music in the text is uh very spot on and mm -hmm. this was an audio drama released around the same time as a synthology and it was a very fine audio drama we will probably cover more when we're going to talk about audio dramas in detail but it's one of my favorites i've heard it a lot over the years so i used to have the cassette and um it even had a painted cover by drew struzan for the audio drama which not even this anthology had a struzan cover but the audio drama did and uh there was another one that got the audio drama treatment we just skip ahead real quick to uh, night lily the lover's tale and that was the two aliens that are kind of nudging each other lovingly in the cantina um felt to pern travag the go tall with the cones and then they're, you got very, they're very racist yeah go he's tall. very very speciest uh oh yeah spe that's what you would call it species right he hates humans and he talks down about humans throughout the story which is really funny and um and then he hooks up with night lily which is her nickname her uh real name is uh miyum miyum onith and uh that's another one great audio drama i which is actually expands the short story by barbara hambly and uh it, it adds some extra scenes and, and so on so it's worth seeking out on compact disc or mp3 <laughs> or cassette um or cassette and uh barbara hambly wrote uh the children of the jedi and she also wrote planet of twilight during the bantam years and uh barbara hambly has you're you're getting her, ahead of yourself now though because a little to... bit a little bit well what i'm going to say barbara hambly has a background in writing um i think romantic fiction and horror mm, actually and what's that funny sounds is exactly like that story i was gonna say she was very uh fit well right in with that topic because i don't want to spoil anything but trevag definitely has a uh an end that's a gruesome end in that story right um but we'll go back to uh we're going to talk about hunt the hunters hunter's fate greedo's tale now this one is your favorite i believe right it's an interesting way to put it <laughs> it's not I really, I don't like Greedo, and as a character, the, yeah, he just comes off as really annoying in it. Yeah, um, super naive and annoying. And there's oh, no, do you mean you mean in the story, not in general? In the in the story, yeah, but in general, I mean, as much as we saw Greedo outside of this story, I mean that he is the story, right? Right. Like right. Um. And I really um, didn't like the prose very much either. It, yeah, it, just, it was uh, it was just not Simplistic. enjoyable. Yeah, it's very and it's written by uh, Tom Veach and Martha Veach. Tom Veach, of course, wrote Dark Empire and Dark Empire Two and Empire's End, mm -hmm. the comic, the Dark Horse comic series, and he also co-wrote with kevin j anderson um well he wrote by himself i think tales of the jedi the the initial six-part comic miniseries and then with kevin j anderson they co-wrote the dark lords of the sith follow-up as well as the sith war and then i i'm pretty sure he wrote um the end cap on those stories which was tales of the jedi redemption yeah and that's that i stuff. like i liked all those stories and stuff 
Those and, are good. I think I think Tom Veach, he might be one of those authors that works better in a comic medium. Maybe. I'm not sure if because, that was the problem or if it was just the headspace he was in, you know, he was he was writing for a particular Yeah. You know. You know, I well also Dark Empire, Dark Empire and especially Dark Empire 2 and Empire's End, the sequels they're pretty simplistic and they have that very comic book quality that just like things just happen instantaneously mm -hmm. like you know it's it's very the opposite of zon where everything is drawn out and intricate and everything um but yeah Greedo's story i i think they also i think they put those the band's tail and Greedo's up front because those are the most iconic for the cantina mm -hmm. yeah so, so they knew they could grab new readers and be like oh i want to read about Greedo." right right you know but um yeah it was just okay it is you do learn about Greedo's childhood growing up on this jungle planet, and then you know, I just don't know his... if if he was supposed to have been sympathetic because it just came off as annoying. And then later He's... with Wu Her's story, yes. I was actually like, "Ah, oh, yes, good. <laughs> good. yes." Actually, that's a good transition. There's not. I mean, we could talk more about Greedo's tale, but it's it's just okay. He he hooks up with other bounty hunters they kind of sell him out to a certain degree and then i course, guess in retrospect that's kind of funny because they kind of like just you they know, make fun of him. With him and they yeah. make fun of him and then they you know they kind of so it's kind of i guess not well i don't know maybe that's part of the sympathetic angle of it it just i yeah, think I just it is never i think sympathetic. i think he was written to be a moron and annoying on purpose so that then when he is shot it's like oh Sweet relief. That's true. That's true. Audience. Maybe, yeah. I maybe it's just uh he's just an annoying little shit. Right. He deserved to die. Right. Um <laughs> it is it is interesting that he meets up. We see his first meeting with Han at Docking Bay 94 before yeah. the movie scene, which is like the second or possibly even third time he's uh faced off with a uh, Han Han and Chewie. Yeah. But um it's trying to get those credits for Java, and uh, Han just doesn't want to pay it. Um, but there is some little callbacks to Dark Empire in it. Uh, Narshada has a significant portion of the story, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a couple bounty hunters, Dyes and the Taz, and uh, Spurch Warhog Goa. They were background characters in Dark Empire that were just part of the background and were expanded on in the Dark Empire source book. Yeah, Which I like cool. that. I like that kind of stuff because it yeah it helps solidify and tie, yes. tie things together. Definitely. And uh then we got Hammer Tong, the tale of the Tanika sisters by Timothy Zahn. Is that and how you say it? I always say Tonica. I used to say Tonica too, but I actually have the Hammer Tong audio drama, which came with okay, there was a box set of the Thrawn trilogy audio dramas. That sounds really familiar. It, it was in a kind of a I don't not really a velvet lined case, but like fake velvet. Mm -hmm. And it was like six cassettes. And then cassette number seven was Hammer Chong. Mm -hmm. And it was an exclusive to this set. And and the, the case looks like the Millennium Falcon kind of when you close it. Yeah, and I I was lucky enough. I used to see this in in the old Insider, the Jawa Trader catalog back in the nineties, and I think I think the set was like fifty bucks or maybe more. And uh, when I finally I I found it used, or maybe it was my dad found it. I can't remember a thrift store or something. I uh, picked it up for like maybe it was ten bucks. It was like dirt cheap, and. Uh, I heard the audio drama, and the only bummer was it's just a narrated audio drama, so it's not like full cast like the other two. But it is an audio drama. Well, not just a... no, it, it's an audio book. I should clarify, it's okay. an audio book, but it it is it does have sound effects and mm -hmm. and music. So just like any other audio book, it has those things, and I can't rem remember who narrates it. It was a woman. And she was an actress, you know, just like a lot of those audiobooks back in the day. And um, 
they she said it as Tonika. So I, I assumed that was the only time I had heard it from an official source. So I just like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'm just going to keep saying Tonica until I hear <laughs> Zahn or somebody with more, uh, weight behind them. <laughs> right. Some unknown <laughs> actress. Um, now what's cool about Hammer Tom, we meet, uh, Carolee and Shada do call who are the uh, mistral shadow guard they're like a female society of women warriors from this planet and they get hired by this guy to transport this thing called hammer tongue and they end up there's an ambush they have to escape this imperial base they fly to tatooine and they still don't know what this hammer tongue thing is the the strike cruiser they're on crashes in the desert later as the story progresses we find out that it's like a big laser kind of like, I don't know, junction or pipe or, or some like, you know, funnel for the, uh, the death star. Cause it says DS Mark two on the side of it. So I think it's up to the audience to kind of put two and two together. It, the characters have no idea really what this is, um, other than they want to get it to the rebel alliance or whatever but um yeah which i didn't i really didn't pick up that it was a piece of the death star 2's super laser i don't know right. why i don't know right. why. i'm super dense about certain things sometimes right um you i think you pointed <laughs> pointed it out to me i don't know if i forgot we were, it and i knew we were, at the we time. were talking about it in our game commentary a few days right. ago um i yeah so it's um yeah i don't know that was that was the the biggest thing from that story that i remember also um i thought it was funny that they had that that sort of data pad in the canteen yeah. that would identify oh, yeah. people right i was like that's that's a convenient contrivance I know. to <laughs> seriously to show what's going on yeah, I know. It was almost like a smartphone, but like face scanning people and then figuring out their background. Um, mm -hmm. But what I like, though, is that the way Zahn wrote the story, you know, because the, the Tanika sisters in the movie, they're not identical twins. Right. And so it was convenient and interesting of him to explain that, to say it's not actually the Tanika sisters, it's Shada and Carolee in disguise as the Tanika sisters because the, even the guy at the jail cell when they're captured says, you know, I could have sworn I saw you at Jabba's on a transport going to Jabba's palace like two hours ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that was kind of cool. And then, well, because in, in obviously in the movie, they weren't described as like identical twins, but in right. other things they were right. Other things like that they was were, the, that was the discrepancy is that in other, yeah source material that were described as identical twins and right yeah they were just clearly not identical so there was a story vignette in the movie trilogy source book by weston games that that they knew han and lando and han played a trick on lando by using the twins to swindle lando of some money or something like that i and remember then, that I, well, well, yeah that was in one of the source books yeah it was in the movie trilogy source book did it's probably did it one anywhere else no it well it might have been in the the bio possibly in like the essential guide to characters oh maybe that's where probably it. probably okay. was but it originally came from the movie trilogy source book and um yeah so that was always a, a funny little interesting side thing now what's also cool is the character of uh, shada uh is seen in the background of the thrawn trilogy she's there's, you know, Talon Card has these, the, these smugglers he's trying to ally with to join them with the New Republic and help them out. Among the smugglers, there's this guy named Mazik, and Mazik's bodyguard is Shada in the mm -hmm. Thrawn trilogy. So Zahn likes to do this where he'll take a secondary character or a background character from one of his novels and then use them in a short story, which then ties into another thing. So it's kind of cool. He has his own internal continuity. And then 
as a result of this, Shada later showed up two or three years later in the Hand of Thrawn books. I think still working for Mazik, I think. But she basically the the Mistral Shadow Guard, I think, was a small plot point in that duology. And it's been years since I read it, but I do remember that. Yeah. And um so yeah, I, I thought it was a pretty good Zahn story. Not my favorite, but he he tied in some interesting you know, continuity that paid off later, which is what he's kind of known for. Yeah, and I, I've always liked that about the stuff that he writes because it's consequential to his, like, corner of Star Wars. Yes. It, it all always. interconnects. Yeah, he's kind of like this one. He's written other stories where fans at the time were kind of like, oh, that was just kind of okay, and then, bam, it really pays off in one of his novels or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... That's pretty cool. Um, and then we got uh, Play It Again, Figrin Dan, The Tale of Muftak and Kabe by A.C. Crispin, otherwise known as Anne Crispin. Rest in peace. She passed away uh, a few years ago from cancer. And she was the author of the Han Solo trilogy uh, back in the 90s that tied together all the Han pre A New Hope stories. And that was, uh, that was a great trilogy, too. That was a great trilogy. That being a big deal when it came out. That was very cool. Anne Crispin was, you know, she wasn't the most intricate writer, but she she really nailed Han's personality and she really tied dozens and dozens of story threads together to make an overarching trilogy for Han that was really satisfying that led from him of about 19 years old leading up right up to when he meets obi-wan and luke in the cantina mm -hmm. so I definitely recommend people check out that trilogy um move talk and kabe are interesting move talk is the towels who's the furry multi-eyed alien that goes -na 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 -na. that that's him oh and, man you uh, should you should kabe do voice work for Dude, it sounded like Move stars. Talk was in the room just yeah. now. Like, I was amazed. And um, Kabe is the little squeaky, kind of bat like uh, creature who's a Chadra fan. And she's reaching for the beer at the bar because she's so small. Jury juice, see. right? Yeah, I think it's jury juice. That's her, she was, her thing. She was uh, addicted. Yeah, and she's, she's constantly a... pining for it. She's an and... alcoholic, <laughs> alcoholic bat. <laughs> and you know, I, their story is really charming. I actually really liked it. It's it's not it's not the greatest or anything, but there's a certain charm to it. They have this very um, Muftak watches over Kabe. She's like a child, and and Muftak, even he doesn't know his own species. He doesn't know where he's from. He's just always grown up in Mos Eisley, and. Um, I don't know. They have this interesting little relationship. And then, you know, we see them, we see Muftak have a conversation with uh, Moma Nadon, Hammerhead. Um, they talk for a bit. And so, you know, that whole cantina scene kind of makes more sense. And, uh, and then they try robbing Jabba's townhouse, which is uh, there in Mos Eisley. And... So I thought that I think, was a cool aspect of the story to kind of paint that picture of Jabba having a townhouse yeah, in the city. And actually, the townhouse came from... Actually, I should mention this, too, because this is important. There was a, a role-playing book, uh, Galaxy Guide 7, Mos Eisley, which was... West End Games had these galaxy guides about different things. And it was obvious, if you read Tales from the Mos Eisley Cantina, that they gave all the authors this guide because the, they would cherry pick certain things from it. And I had it, uh, I had gotten it like maybe six months before the, the anthology had come out. So I was very familiar with it. And, uh, there was a map of Mos Eisley in there. And if that's the other cool thing, if you read the stories, you can kind of find little key things on the, the map of the city. 
and uh, Jabba's townhouse was a thing, and it was kind of like his his criminal haven while he's in town. And uh, yeah, it was cool seeing uh, or reading about Muftak and Kabe robbing it. There's a fire that breaks out, and Muftak is trying to, you know, shoot off the bad guys, and Kabe pulls him out, and and uh, I can't and the remember droid what they were. Too. Yeah, there was, was a droid. droid that they removed the restraining bolt on. Yeah, it was like Jabba's translator droid who was like tortured under working under Jabba the Hutt. And uh, they they end up breaking free a rebel that was in a cell thanks to the translator droid helping them out. And then the rebel gets Muftak and Kabe passage off planet, presumably to find their fortune and glory. And the rest of the galaxy, um, yeah, charming little story. I, I, I give... like that one because I thought uh, I thought Kabe was really funny. Yeah, yeah, she's like a little kid, little whiny kid, and she always wants her jury, jury juice and little you know, alcoholic was... kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, then we got uh, the Sand Tender, the Hammerhead's Tale by dave wolverton who of course at this point had written the courtship of princess leia and he later wrote the first jedi apprentice book in 99 the rising force and i think there was one other thing oh he had written some uh star wars missions books remember remember those they were like the kind of the game slash it was like a tabletop game for kids, but they had these tie-in novels. Yeah, not really novels, but they That's were vaguely they were, familiar. We used to collect them. Me and you, we we'd see them, like on the road trips. I think we picked up a couple because they would be in used bookstores and such. Mm -hmm. um, they're really some of them are really hard to track down. Uh, not to get off on a tangent here, but I think there's like eighteen of them and. I have, I think, all of them, but the number 18, the last book, because it was near the end of its run, it, it had low print numbers. Yeah. And if you try looking on eBay or Amazon, people want like $300 for it. It's just insane. But uh, yeah. So anyway, um, The Sand Tender, The Hammerhead's Tale. What did you think of this one? Uh, I really liked it with the background for... Uh... Ithorians and their home world mm -hmm. and what the what the empire had done and all that stuff was really fascinating like it really painted you know a a bigger picture of what was going on as yeah. far as it's it very tragic yes and it went well beyond what was going on in most Eisley as far as right. backstory so right yeah Moma Nadon used to be like a herd leader a, a captain of one of the herd ships that the Ithorians have and he's forced to either give up the secrets of their plant growing technologies and things like that or the empire is going to destroy part of the jungle so he has to do it and then as a result of this he is cast out from his people and basically is in exile on uh, Tatooine where he has his own little um, agriculture. I don't know what you call it. Biodome. <laughs> Biodome. <laughs> well, the trees are semi-sentient, right? Like, they're, yeah. Yeah. They've got kind of a hive collective going on. Cause he has to, he consults with the trees in his own, yes. in his own hut or whatever, his own biodome. Right. Before killing that. Oh, that's uh, right. Lieutenant Alima or yes. Captain Alima or whatever it is. He has a vendetta against Momo Nadon. And well, so I think, the whole he, story... I think he got busted down, right? I think there was something yes. where he was he was a lieutenant yes. and got busted or whatever. I don't remember which one is the higher no, than you're the right. other. You're right. And that was um, part of why Alima was so He was bitter. Pissed at him, yeah. Yeah, so the whole story is this push and pull, and Momo Nadon gets his face beat in by Alima at one point, and 
is left to just bleed in an alleyway. And then Moma Nadon wants to kill him, but killing is it goes against his culture and his is basically his religion. And the plants are telling him in their t telepathy, you know, don't do it. You know, he's, you know, you can't kill anybody it doesn't matter how evil they are but then at the end of the story not to spoil too much but things uh come to a head with alima and justice is served in its own unique way they come to a hammerhead <laughs> yeah um <laughs> but yeah it that that was a good one uh, it was a very you know you know hammerhead is one of the most iconic cantina creatures over the years. I, a lot of kids had the action figure. I had mm -hmm. the figure when I was a kid. Um, that was one of my first Star Wars figures. And so it's, all, it's also the worst model in Mysteries <laughs> of the Sith, the Mysteries yes. of the Sith video game. That has got to be <laughs> the worst 3D model. It's very rough to do those curvatures of, of the Hammerhead's head. Um, and that's funny too that the ones in the, that game are like evil and wanting to kill you because it's not really Ithorians. Yeah. They are, but yeah. It's a video game. <laughs> so um, maybe they were all brainwashed by the Empire uh, and became pirates. But yeah, that's that's a pretty uh, good story. I, I give that one a B, plus, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we got Be Still My Heart, The Bartender's Tale by David Bischoff. Um, I'm not familiar with David Bischoff's writing background. He's, he hadn't, unlike some of the other ones we're talking about here, he, he didn't write a, a Star Wars novel at this point, but, um, so he's an unknown author to us, but, uh, I really liked his take on, on Wooer and why he hates droids and all that stuff. We, we talked about that during a Dark Forces commentary. Yeah, we that had sounds, we had a you know that sounds significant right. uh talk about that for like five minutes, but um and it, I don't know, maybe it's cliche to make woo her hate droids. You know, it's it's like one of those things like, oh, we see this in the movie, so this implies this. Well, you know, like <laughs> it's one of those things. Well, what it what's what's cool about the story is that it, it the way it explains why he hates droids he doesn't really have a specific reason other than it's droids are lower on the totem pole than he is because he himself was so like you know uh, abused and hated by you know his uh his peers yeah like, it, it, you know alien uh bartenders and and uh Right, patrons that didn't believe that he could, you know, make them a proper drink because he was only a human. Right, so he, he has he has to kick whoever's lower than him. Yeah, it's kind of like that, good. you know, shit rolls downhill type thing. Yep, poodoo. Yep, poodoo rolls downhill. Very true. Um, and then one day in an alleyway, he meets uh, I can't remember the droid's name offhand, but it's like that. Yeah, uh, unique C two like R four. That's it. He's like a unique weird hybrid astromech that's like uh not like other droids and it turns out after saving uh c2 from jawas who nearly uh pilfer him turns out he is a really good at mixing drinks this droid and uh he just needs one key ingredient to make the perfect drink for jabba the hut which happens to be, I don't know if it's Greedo mashed up or Greedo's blood or Greedo's Greedo head. Greedo juice. Greedo juice. So, Wooer retreats. Well, the droid does something, right? I think the droid processes him in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And then Wooer, it's funny, in, in the downstairs in the cantina, Wooer has this, like, laboratory of, mm -hmm. like, like beakers and like mixers and like computers and like it it almost makes me think of like frankenstein's laboratory the way it's described yeah and it's basically just like this this huge uh you know what would you call it distillery or whatever yeah and um 
So he's trying to create he's making this perfect... moonshine. <laughs> moonshine. He's making Greedo we, shine. We were shine. Um, yeah, he's trying to make the perfect drink for Jabba the Hutt as a way to get into his good grace and to, I don't know if he was trying to get in the palace. I can't remember. Maybe become his cook or something. But um, no, I think he wanted to to become his like bartender or whatever. Yes, yeah, and then like eventually that. get off world and all that stuff. But right, it's, right. it's interesting that uh, up until this point, most everybody is trying to get out of Jabba's grasp, right? And we're yeah. just trying to get trying in to there. Get in, <laughs> right? He's sick of working the cantina. Um, uh, yeah, so. I, I like the ending. It was very, it's like he retrieves the body of Greedo and then that's the key ingredient, the last thing he needed and for the uh, special drink. Um, but it's a great philosophical story. You know, it, the whole thing about the, the totem of where droids stand in the galaxy and how they're seen by the common citizens of uh, mm -hmm. the Star Wars universe. So, well, and, and just the whole dynamic of how the, this, the cycle of abuse or racism or whatever yeah. it's it's a lot deeper than it appears because of that i really yeah. liked i really liked the story for that and um at the at the end i was really like i still am just thinking about it anxious about like what was he what was he going to do when he ran out of greedo juice for Java? <laughs> right like, was he going to was it greedo specifically or was it, could he kill another Rodian? Right, um, yeah, that that's interesting. It's like his essence. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm curious, like, what would have happened? Because, you know, if, if he ran out of Greedo juice to make his drinks, Jabba would be pissed, probably. Well, I'll tell you what Wooer could do. He could go to where Kyle Katarn hangs out. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, constantly. Just follow him around. <laughs> Just follow him around and all these uh, Greedo clones that seem to be attacking Kyle Katarn. Same shitty jacket. Same orange jacket. Same overalls. Um, yeah, that might be the plan. Um, but uh, we're going to do part two of our Tales from the Most Ice the Cantina discussion uh, later on. And we wanted to cover those for now. You know... Uh... Uh, it just occurred to me that what Wooer could do is uh, kill Wald and <laughs> boil down his essence. Maybe right. he's a secret key. Yeah, you never know. Um, Una yoki, Annie. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah, what is Wald up to on, on Tatooine these days? Um, I, you know, I can't remember if he was in Tatooine Ghost or not when I read we that. We needed a Tales from Mos Espa. I know. We did. We really did. And now it's too late, I think. Um, <laughs> unless they're doing it. You think? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, like, they came back with prequel fiction again, I think because of the uh, the anniversary of The Phantom Menace a couple years ago. They mm -hmm. had the, uh, the Amidala book that was uh, set before The Phantom Menace, and then, of course, we got Master and Apprentice with, with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, mm -hmm. and then we had a second Amidala book, and there's a third one coming out later this year. So, the prequel era... It's getting a little bit of uh, fictional love again. Well, I, I think... won't. I won't hold my breath for a Wald book. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait and see on that. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, this about wraps up our episode here. Uh, we would invite everybody to please drop us a line, drop us a comment, question. You can reach us at our, of course, YouTube page. Just look up Star Wars Unfiltered. We are at Star Wars Unfiltered at Yahoo.com check out the facebook page as well as instagram where we are so yeah any anything uh, anyone wants to drop just uh bring it on by We're, we are open for business us and our three listeners we are we're there and uh yeah i think that does it for this episode and we will catch everybody on the flip side next time good night so, uh, which website did Chewbacca get arrested for for creating? I don't know what. WikiLeaks. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Free the Wookiee. There's your, there's your Star Wars dad joke for the week, everybody. You're welcome. <laughs>